You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Thank you, Tony. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for, uh, for coming on a, on a Thursday morning in Miami when it's 75, 80 degrees out there. I uh, appreciate you uh, attending this morning. Thanks for coming to the conference. Um, also, a big, uh, big round of thanks to uh, the OIC as well as Box for putting on this event this year. Uh, I know they work very hard. I've watched these guys uh, for the past couple of days setting things up and, and dealing with all the things that happened. So uh, thanks to, uh, to Patty and, and Eddie and, and Tony as well as Lisa for putting on this great show. Um, so I, as Tony mentioned, I've done this uh, kind of state of the industry for the past several years. Um, and it's usually, you know, that, that glass is half full when I get up here. And this year it's a little bit different. Uh, things have changed a little bit uh, over the past year due, due to uh, the market environment, to the regulatory environment, uh, investor sentiment, uh, chasing returns, et cetera. So things aren't as, as, as rosy as they have been, but there's a lot of opportunity out there. And, and you know, when things return to, uh, to, I guess, less than normal that we've seen for the past couple of years, there's a... There is uh, uh, quite a bit of growth uh, that we've seen, expect in the, uh, in the next several years. So there is absolutely uh, a positive spin to, to my chat today. There's a lot of red in the chart, so I apologize for that. Uh, but I can't do anything about that. It, it is what it is. Um, the other thing I'll say before I do it is these bright lights are, are in my eyes. So if I do fall off the stage, uh, please don't laugh too hard because I almost did it in my, uh, in my prep this morning. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll kind of jump right in here. Um, the um, uh, talk a little bit about what's going on in, in, the, in the market in terms of volume, in terms of most actively traded symbols, volatility, what's going on uh, at a very high level. I'll drill down into some of the factors that are influencing um, you know, these shifts, these changes. Uh, talk a little bit about customer demand, institutional demand, retail demand, uh, foreign demand uh, in, for U.S. listed options. Uh, talk about uh, a few of the challenges we are, we're facing as an industry and then close it out with a, with a couple comments on what to, to look out for, what to be aware of uh, over the next year, over the next couple of years. So looking at volumes, and, and here's the first red arrow. If you look at the left side of this chart, it, it's pretty positive. We have a you know, 15 cent, about 15% compound annual growth rate in options trading. Chart looks really good through 2014, but something happened in the first quarter. Uh, we started to see signs of it towards the end of last year. Um, volume to, uh, started to tail off a little bit. We had some volatility in, in uh, September, uh, end of August, and into October. So there was some spikes in volume. Uh, the first quarter of this year, we're down 10% almost. Uh, you know, about a billion contracts traded uh, in the marketplace. Um, average volumes are, are kind of going down no matter what environment we're in. Volatility environment has some data on that. Uh, so something's going on. Um, and there's, there's a whole bunch of factors that I think are, are, are kind of combining to, uh, to change the picture here. Um, you know, the first thing, volatility, right? So the top chart, everybody's seen this chart. We use this in, in just about any options presentation. The VIX has, you know, been fluctuating. We saw some spikes last year. Uh, the first quarter of this year, it, it, it was pretty high in January, the bottom right. Uh, if you look at the average VIX uh, uh, for the month, it was, you know, higher than the past two years in January. Uh, again, in February and then March, it, it kind of uh, was about the same level as a year ago. So despite higher vol levels, and, and everybody talks about, you know, the VIX being so low and, and not changing a lot, uh, we're still seeing some, some volume declines. Um, so uh, again, not, not sure what to make of it. I think, you know, the positive spin on this chart is May is looking pretty strong. Uh, the first couple of days, a uh, few days of, of May, it looks like we'll have another big day today. The market's uh, starting to go down a little bit, and, and as I talk about uh, in a few minutes, uh, a little bit of volatility is good. Sustained little bit of volatility is great. Uh, and so that's kind of what we're, uh, what we're hoping for in, in the near future. Uh, I think with the Fed uh, poised to, to start raising rates, 
um, a little bit more, uh, you know, angst in the in the marketplace. What's going to happen to fixed income? There's some uh, some fears about uh, what's going on in that space. You know, although uh, from from a, a big picture perspective, not the best thing in the world, but for our market, it, it's obviously a, a good thing. So I, I talked a little bit about higher levels of vol and what that. Uh, uh, what that means for 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 trading, and and we kind of looked at some of the data, and and uh, we pulled some some VIX data, and then uh, some VVIX data, the volatility of uh, volatility index from SIBO, and kind of put things in buckets, and and you know this chart is kind of scary if you look at it. Um, even in highs in times of elevated volatility, we're seeing lower levels of volume. Uh, the you know the far right of this chart, the in the, in the VVIX over 110. Um, you know, volumes for that, uh, for that uh, on, on a daily basis for that uh, bucket are down 13%. Uh, and it doesn't look that much better as you go across the screen. Um, we're also seeing a lot more volatility of vol uh, in the first quarter and, and uh, so far this year. If you look in the top left of this chart, it has the number of times that uh, the VVIX was in those uh, different buckets. Um, so there should be more trading. Um, you know, we hear a lot about exits of market makers from the industry, about wider spreads, um, about lack of liquidity. And I think all these factors are influencing it. Uh, but there's other trends as well that are, that are going on. Uh, looking at the top 10 symbols uh, of trading, again, lots of red on this chart. Uh, a lot of index volume is down for the uh, quarter over quarter. Um, you know, thank God for Apple's split because we saw a big uptick in their volume. Uh, I think the, uh, the, these six symbols accounted for roughly 50% of the decline uh, in options trading in the first quarter. Um, you know, there's less activity in story names, the Twitters, the Facebook, the Teslas. Um, there's some positive aspects. There's a lot of weekly volume and, and weekly growth, so we're seeing more in that space. But, you know, if you look at this stuff, the index volume is down dramatically. Uh, part of it is, you know, why hedge when the market just keeps grinding higher and higher and higher? You might hedge once, twice, but after three times, you're, you know, this uh, mentality of why do I need to hedge is, is really taking hold. You see a vol spike, it goes right back down uh, in the next, uh, next couple of trading sessions. Um, if you look at the uh, kind of the index and the ETF, I think this, this really shows that there's this lack of conviction that people need to hedge. Um, during these times of, of, of crisis and do, during the times of elevated volatility, 2011, you saw the, you know, the volumes in the SPX and SPY just skyrocket. Um, you know, 500 plus million contracts traded in August of 2011. Um, but if you look at this, this chart for the past year in, in the first quarter, you know, even in emerging markets and in, in these index products, the volumes are just going down, down, down. Um, I think on the, on the prior chart, if you look at the bottom there, I have actually have the top 11 because EEM, the Emerging Market ETF, saw a huge decline in volume. Um, there wasn't a lot of volatility in the first quarter in the emerging markets, and, and that's kind of going on in the background. Um, you know, the, the uh, you know, declines in the volatility products. Again, a lack of conviction that you need to be trading volatility uh, in, a, in an upward, uh, upward trading market. Um, and then, you know, the, you have these events that maybe five years ago would, would decimate the market. You have, you know, Iranian warship, uh, you know, pulling over a container ship to board and, and, and take it. But nothing happens in our market. Uh, you have an Ebola crisis and the market goes crazy. You know, Russia invades Ukraine. Not a lot going on there. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting that uh, what may have happened a few years ago uh, and really uh, caused the market to, uh, to spike upward, um, would, uh, uh, would uh, you know, doesn't seem to have the same impact now. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing, and, and I think we're all aware of this, if, if you haven't heard that everybody should be in Europe or in, in emerging markets, um, over the past couple of years, returns from Europe, returns from Asia have, have been a little bit different. Uh, you know, from 2014, if you look at the, uh, the MSCI index for Europe, it's actually been down uh, 1%, and the UK in particular down 4%. But if you look at the right side of the line chart here, you see since the beginning of this year, there's been a lot of uh, investment flows going into Europe. Uh, and then the China, uh, just off the chart, uh, their number, the red line. Um, so there's more interest in, in going into other markets. So you don't have as much uh, demand from institutional investors in the U.S. But also importantly, you don't have as much investment coming from Europe into the U.S. or Asia into the U.S. Um, you know, Tab Group uh, has done a number of studies. We estimate about anywhere from... 
uh, 8 to 12 percent of volume comes from Europe in U.S. listed options market. It may be routed through Europe, but it's coming through Asia, from Asia as well. Um, from what I've heard from talking to clients and investors and, and the banks that have uh, uh, position, uh, um, operations over there, is a lot of the macro strategies are looking elsewhere. You have QE, uh, I guess, one in Europe right now. So they're, you know, they're starting the monetary stimulus, negative interest rates. So there's a lot of investment flows, a lot of interest in investing in Europe. Uh, I saw some data on, uh, on the DAX, I believe, over the past couple of days, and it's up uh, 15% itself in the first uh, year to date. So there's a lot of interest in going into Europe. And if you, if you want to trade Europe and you're not sending money to the U.S., you have lesser need uh, to hedge, to write premium strategies on your, your U.S. holdings. Uh, it goes down to the individual level as well. Private wealth managers are big users of options in the U.S. Uh, for their European clients. Um, when, they're, when they're allocating more funds domestically into the European uh, uh, area, they have less opportunity, less activity, less incentive to trade the U.S. options market. So we're seeing declining demand from, uh, from both Europe and Asia uh, as well. Okay, so here's, here's one of those bright spots, the weeklies. And it has, it's, it's good and bad um, uh, parts of the equation. So, you know, right now, the weekly volumes are about 25% of all trading. Uh, there's five expirations, not including regular expirations. Uh, causes problems for, that I'll talk about a little bit later when we get to, to some of the challenges we're facing. But right now, there's six expirations for the most actively traded names. Uh, you know, 400 plus symbols that are weeklies now versus only 340 in last year's first quarter. So it's a huge, huge uh, interest. There's this compressed demand uh, for exposure, uh, much, uh, uh, much more targeted exposure, uh, directional trading, hedging uh, around corporate events. Um, institutions and retails, uh, do, uh, retail investors do love the products. Um, you know, the bottom of this chart just shows you how strong volumes are in the weekly sector. And, and you know, with uh, things like, um, you know, expansion of this program, uh, soon the, the weekly VIX product's going to be uh, launched. So we'll see continued interest in, uh, uh, in the weeklies, and, and it will continue to be a big growth uh, part of the options market. So looking a little bit at customer demand, and this is, uh, this is where some of the challenges we face as an industry are, are starting to come up. Um, every year, Tab Group does a, uh, a buy-side study. We go out and we talk to 50 buy-side traders about what they're doing with options and the challenges they face. And you know, here's those red colors again on this chart. Um, you know, what are the biggest challenges you face as a, as a, as a trading entity? What, do you, you know, what, do you, what do you, can't you do? What can you do? Um, you know, far and away, the biggest issues they face right now, less liquidity. They're not getting capital from dealers. Spreads are widening out in some of the names they trade, not all the names. Uh, weeklies, again, there's one of those positive things. Fading markets, uh, they go and try to get 1,000 done, and they can only get 740. Um, some understand why with, with the, the structure of the market. Others think it's you know these HF, HFT firms uh, that are front-running them. So there's some misperceptions about market structure in the institutional space as well. And then liquidity fragmentation. Uh, you know, I have a, a chart that I use to... Kind of try and keep track of the number of exchanges. I'm, I'm running out of space on that chart, uh, so maybe a two-page. We have uh, you know 12 exchanges now. Two more announced um, that will be launching by the end of this year, perhaps if the if the regula regulatory authorities allow it. Um, but it causes a lot of challenges if you're trying to get big trades done, and, and market makers have to be on multiple exchanges, manage their risk, and and. You know, when they need to pull, pull their quotes because they start getting hit in size on a particular exchange, you know, the buy side thinks, well, guys, these guys are stepping away and there's HFT guys front running them. And, and you know, if they came off the sell side, if they came off the floor, if they came out of the option industry, they understand that market makers are managing their risk. If they've been trading equity all their life, all they know about is the equity market. So they think that the structure is very much the same uh, and, they're, and they're a little bit uh, concerned about what they see. So it's an educational effort as well for those guys. Um, talked about uh, broker capital and, and uh, what they're doing uh, in terms of providing capital to their, their clients. Uh, every year we ask them, you know, capital from your broker is higher or lower this year. Uh, overwhelmingly this year there was a big decline in the guys saying yes, particularly for more aggressive accounts, uh, hedge funds that are, that are doing uh, sector-specific strategies, for example, um, are being told by their brokers that, sorry, I can't do that trade, why don't you look elsewhere? Um, you know, not the biggest hedge funds. If you're a big account with your, uh, with your broker, uh, they tend to be a little bit more accommodating, uh, not surprisingly, since you pay them more in commissions. 
Uh, but if you're a smaller hedge fund with lesser track record, you're not paying a lot of uh, commissions to your brokers or use multiple brokers on, on demand, uh, you're being told to look elsewhere for capital. So that is absolutely impacting uh, trading by those more aggressive accounts. They're starting to use ETFs. They're starting to use underlines. Uh, they're starting to go OTC when they can. Um, on the other side of the equation is kind of the asset management community. Um, they are, uh, you know, the pristine client, the, the, the mutual funds, the long only guys, the guys that are doing books of business across multiple assets, fixed income, equity, derivatives, futures. They're providing a lot of commissions. So the dealers, the brokers are much more willing to provide them with capital uh, simply because they're a more important account. Um, you know, a lot of things behind this, uh, uh, the decline in capital, you know, brokers are rationalizing their business lines. Uh, they're subject, the, the bank holding companies are subject to, uh, you know, new Basel rules on uh, how they can allocate ca risk capital, how they have to account for it. Um, and down the road, that's just going to get worse. We're only starting to see the first part of Basel III uh, limitations on extending risk to clients. It's just starting to work its way down the food chain within the banks. So it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And, and firms are going to rationalize what they do, where they do it, and how they do it in not only uh, options markets, but futures markets, cash equities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be a, a very changed world in two or three years. Um, opportunity for new entrants, absolutely, but it's also going to change the way the game is played for the bigger firms uh, that have been in the business for, for a long time. Um, so this chart on the left side is, is something Tab Group publishes in, our, in a couple of publications, Options uh, Liquidity Matrix uh, and our, our quarterly. Um, I show this chart, and, and you know, sometimes people jump across the table and say, you know, what are you doing here? What are you showing? Uh, our clients aren't seeing this. Uh, so we dug a little bit deeper into the data. We've been you know, using this chart for the past two or three years to show what's going on in, in the options market. And until it started to go up, nobody really cared or nobody noticed. But once it, it peaked last year at the end of the year, uh, when spreads were up around 40 cents, 41 cents a contract across all, all options, um, you know, the, the noise became louder. So we dug into it, um, and it's a bifurcated market. It's tiering of liquidity. Uh, you know, more than seven, almost 75% of all volume and options are traded in those top 100 names. Um, that's a really, really liquid market. It's penny wide spreads all day, day long uh, for the most active uh, symbols. Um, and so we looked at the, the data from, uh, from the beginning of 14 to, uh, to uh, last month, April. Um, and the top 100 names actually saw a tightening of spreads. Uh, spreads are down about 30% uh, in those names. Uh, but where the challenges are starting to show up are, are in those less actively traded names. And, and guess what? Those are the kinds of names that retail are trading. They're trading, you know, they're writing premium strategies on their holdings of, of, uh, of stock in their retirement accounts, uh, in their regular cash accounts, in their accounts that they've built up. So, you know, it's, it's lesser traded names, it's less liquidity in those names. And if you look at the screens, um, you see these dollar, two dollar, three dollar wide spreads in, in you know, uh, top ten names, but it's out two, three months, or, or uh, excuse me, the top 100 names. Uh, it's out two or three months. Um, it's deep in the money calls. It's stuff that, you know, retail will look at and use as, as a, a replacement strategy. So, um, you know, it is a concern. Um, a lot of reasons behind it. I could spend hours talking about why market makers are, are having a really tough time and, and all the things they have to face, but uh, this is more the, the overview. Happy to, to talk to anybody about that, and we have some research coming out on market quality and all the things that are impacting uh, our markets in terms of costs, regulatory costs, compliance costs, uh, exchange fees, um, you know, uh, clearing fees, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on. The one good thing about our markets, which is actually unique in the, in the world, is, is the, the dominance or the, the big position that retail investors have in our marketplace. It's what makes our markets tick. It's why market makers love to be in the, uh, in the space. Um, you know, there's almost, uh, I guess, about 24% of all trading in options markets now is, is uh, coming out of the retail firms, out of self-directed retail investors. Um, you know, almost half of customer volume they represent. I think other than in a few other markets around the world, maybe Amsterdam, Italy to some extent, and, and uh, some of the Asian markets, um, you know, ours is the only market that has such a big retail presence. Um, and that's actually held up the market over the past couple of years. Is, is, uh, you know, institutional investors have stepped away to some extent. The retail has been in there uh, trading a lot. The, the educational efforts by uh, not only the OIC but all the retail brokers um, are, are helping drive all this volume. Uh, all the interest in trading options. Um, 
There are some, uh, some issues, though, uh, coming out of Washington. Uh, I think we all are aware of the camp proposal that was announced a couple of years ago, uh, pitched as a way to, to hit after, uh, you know, all those, uh, that potential revenue from options trading. Uh, there was a, an announcement earlier this week. Um, I'm still trying to track down, but it was uh, something from the uh, Department of Labor uh, and how they may be looking at the use of options and futures in retirement accounts. Uh, so that's other, another uh, danger signal. And, and again, it's this incessant uh, desire to raise revenues from taxing uh, our industry because we're a very, uh, very attractive target and, and everybody still has uh, kind of the, uh, you know, the, the mentality that it's, it's all Wall Street's fault. Um, so again, uh, keep your eye on what's coming out of Washington. We're doing some work around that, looking at how much volume actually comes out of the individual investors. And, and you know, as an industry, we have to keep an eye on this, particularly with the uh, elections coming up in, uh, uh, in the next, I guess there's 18 months or so. So I talked about you know, how retail is a big part of our market. They're also doing a lot of interesting things on the retail side. Um, they're starting to emulate many of the strategies that institutional investors use. They're doing more spreads. Fastest growing segment of retail trading is complex orders. Uh, multi-legged strategies, two, three, four-legged strategies. Um, they're becoming more educated. They're becoming more sophisticated. They're using options as a way to generate revenue, uh, income uh, as, instead of just speculating. Um, you know, with so, a lot of the, uh, the higher price stocks that uh, they're in the market um, these days, a lot of retail investors will simply do a, a directional trade. They'll, they'll do a stock replacement strategy. They'll buy a much cheaper call through an earnings event or, or even uh, some of the leaps over, over time uh, and get exposure to the stock that way. It's a lot cheaper for them. It, uh, you know, in, in some instances, it's a, it's a better way to trade. Um, the other thing that's driving that is, is continued uh, developments in technology. Uh, you know, our industry lives and dies on technology now. Twelve exchanges, everybody looking for liquidity, trying to find the best price, um, you know, straight through processing, efficiency on the back end. Uh, retail investors now have access to tools that are absolutely institutional quality on their desktop. Um, they can do, you know, multi, multi-legged spread trades. They can uh, model out the best uh, exposure uh, surface they want. Um, so the tools they have are, are facilitating new strategies, facilitating more sophisticated strategies, and, and you know, again, that is driving uh, some of their, um, of, their, uh, uh, of their activity, expanding activity. So a little bit on uh, some of the challenges we face. Again, I'll, I'll go through these pretty quickly. I have a couple minutes left here. Um, you know, big, big challenge. Liquidity continues to be bunched up in those top 100 names. Uh, almost, you know, 73, 74% of all trading occurs in those top 100 names, and that's up from just 70, 70% uh, for last year's first quarter. Um, again, it's compression of liquidity in the front, uh, front weeks. Uh, you know, the weeklies account for 25, 30% of trading now. Top 100 names all have weeklies. It's, again, the short-term focus. Uh, funds and, and, and retail investors are writing premium strategies, not quarterly, not monthly anymore, but weekly. They're rolling those positions constantly, constantly. Um, you know, it was a big, uh, one of the things we found in our study this year is uh, the rapid embracement of, of weeklies by asset managers, by long-only accounts. Uh, they are, are much more bullish on these products than even hedge funds are uh, because they're doing much more. It's not replacing regular, stra- uh, regular expiration strategies. It's additive to liquidity. So that's a, a big part of, of kind of we're concerned that you know, this, uh, this shift to weeklies is taken away from those regular expirations. Um, we, we've found in talking to the buy side that's actually adding to what they're doing. Uh, again, those, uh, those weeklies, the concentration in those, those instruments is even more uh, uh, fulsome. You have almost 58% of all trading in weeklies in those top 10 names. Again, the retail names, the index names, uh, a lot of these, uh, these product sets that, uh, that institutional investors are trading. Um, you know, they become a, 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 a directional instrument in times of volatility when there's an earnings event. If you look what's going on in the Apple options uh, when they have, a, you know, an Apple product day, it's absolutely incredible how much volume trades uh, in those weeklies, uh, particularly around at the money. They trade like, you know, you just, the, the, the screen just absolutely flies by with, uh, with, you know, one lot, three lots, five lots, ten lots. Uh, they trade like a stock uh, when, there's, uh, when there's a huge uh, volatility event. Uh, again, you get all this concentrated liquidity, all this activity uh, in these top 10 names, um, and it becomes a very uh, challenging uh, environment uh, for, for the brokers, for the exchanges, for the clearing firms, 
uh, to manage all this, uh, this trading activity. Uh, 12 exchanges, two more on the way. You know, I, I bet if we looked at this chart, we could figure out who's going to launch the next exchange after these two. Um, you, know, you have to be in it. You have to be able to access all your customer base, all your potential customer flow. Um, so we're not stopping here. We'll have 14 uh, by the end of the year and, and perhaps one or two more uh, in the near-term future. Um, again, talking about all this concentration of liquidity, the dependence on technology, and, and everybody's using technology more and more. So market makers, yeah, they have to, they, they depend, they live and die on technology. If they're quoting on multiple exchanges, they have, uh, you know, automated trading uh, uh, infrastructures, et cetera. They, almost all their volume is, is done electronically. Um, they still do some over the phone. They still take sh uh, shows. Uh, they're still doing some point-click risk management on the screens. Institutions as a group uh, have, have been gravitating towards more electronic trading, uh, particularly long-only guys. Uh, you know, two years ago, 90% of the volume these guys were doing was over the phone. Uh, this year, they're doing about, uh, I guess, 60 65% of their trades, chunkier trades, of course, on the phone, but they're still, in, still doing 30 40% of their uh, volume electronically. So that's a trend that's going to continue and continue and continue. Retail, again, uh, self-directed retail is, is doing almost all their trading um, through the front ends, through the websites um, to, to get exposure and picking up the phone. Generally, an older clientele picking up to do a bigger trade and, and calling their broker to, to kind of get that facilitated. Um, so what does all this mean? You have all these weeklies. You have concentration of liquidity. You have faster markets, 12, 14 exchanges. Um, you know, a little bit of volatility and, and uh, message rate spikes and, and uh, uh, go crazy. There's more than a million series and options now. Uh, at the end of last year, I think it was uh, just over 800,000. Um, that's a lot of options to quote, to price, to keep track of, to, to settle, to clear. Um, you need technology. You depend on technology for that. Um, and that's just going to continue as more weeklies are added, as more expirations, as more dollar and 50 cent strikes are going on. Um, I think the, the bottom part of this chart is, is something we, you know, the industry used to focus on a few years ago until bandwidth became uh, you know, less expensive and, and uh, servers or, you know, st uh, data storage is, is cheaper and cheaper. Um, but the first quarter of this year, we had message rates, peak message rates of 10 million per second. Um, that is a huge, huge jump from even one year ago or two years ago. Uh, when systems fail, that's when all that uh, really comes to fore. Um, you know, in, uh, in the first quarter of, of 2014, you know, the industry decided that we can't look at, you know, messages per second. We're going to look at messages per 100 millisecond intervals, and I think that's pretty telling. Our markets are just getting faster and faster. Um, underlying markets are getting faster and faster, and as a, as a market maker, as an industry, you have to really keep up with uh, um, all those changes. So what else do we have to worry about here in our, our industry? Um, I mentioned Basel III, uh, risk-weighted uh, assets coming uh, um, uh, in Washington, how you, uh, how you look at your risk. Uh, you know, Amir in Europe, uh, they're looking at HFT and, and ways to tax. Um, you know, uh, the, the financial industry over there uh, raise, uh, raise revenue, so that's still on the horizon. Um, you know, tax initiatives. Again, I mentioned the, the, uh, the lingering of the CAMP proposal, uh, which would have a devastating effect on our industry. Um, if you're not familiar with, uh, with the metrics, uh, with the, how that works effectively, if you uh, use an option to hedge or to earn premium on an existing stock position you own, uh, that becomes a taxable event. Um, so it's an accounting, uh, accounting, accountant's dream. It's an investor's nightmare. Um, it will absolutely crush demand uh, for using options as, as part of retail strategies. Um, you know, there's tax reform. What do we have coming down the pike? There's not a lot of, uh, of, of commentary around that, but if you look at the bottom of this page, and, and I just ran out of space, we have an election coming up, and it's, you know, you look at these guys, and, and they're waving their hands in the air and pointing fingers and looking for new ways to, to raise revenue. And, and uh, you know, I have my druthers on, on all these pictures, but it, it's fun looking at the pictures and trying to figure out which one you want to put where. Um, but it is, uh, you know, Wall Street's going to be a target. Uh, 18 months from now, everybody's going to start talking about what they're going to do, how they're going to change the world and uh, raise taxes and, and uh, lower taxes for certain individuals. So it's, uh, it's going to be uh, an interesting time post-election and, and what comes down the pike. So we, we have to be aware as an industry uh, that these things, uh, that the, the political 
uh, movements and, and uh, things they're doing in Washington can have a huge impact on what we do uh, day to day. Um, this chart is, is probably going to start another conversation, and, and it, it's some data that came out from BIS uh, looking at uh, uh, OTC options. Um, it, uh, it came up a lot in conversations with the buy side last fall and, and last year. Um, a lot of these guys are looking at OTC markets as a way to better get access exposure and do things uh, differently with, uh, with more anonymity, uh, with more flexibility, um, and, and with, frankly, ease of access. Right? They can pick up the phone. They can do an OTC trade, not only domestically, but internationally. It becomes a bigger, uh, a bigger part of, uh, of investors in Europe, investors in Asia are very familiar with using uh, variant swaps and volatility product sets uh, that are traded OTC. Uh, you know, it's actually, uh, uh, you know, forwards and options and swaps uh, indexed to U.S. equity are, you know, at really at, at record levels. Even after the financial crisis, they just, uh, you know, this incessant grind upwards, you know, 17% compound annual growth rate. If that continues over the next couple of years, this is going to be a, a really, really big market. And uh, uh, a lot of this isn't uh, so much impacted by things like Dodd-Frank and Emmer, um, uh, probably pronounce that wrong, but uh, there are you know there are facets to this that the the regulators will start looking at and, and um, you know becoming more interested as, as they continue to grow. So just kind of winding down here, you know what are the things we uh, that we see on the horizon and what's going to happen? Um, again, investors are going to be chasing returns. Uh, our market has has gone up, up, up. We're at re- you know we're at record levels until uh, the past couple of days. Um, you know, Yellen actually started talking about her version of uh, irrational exuberance uh, yesterday, and I think we're going to see some, some follow-up on that. Um, there's, you know, there's lack of, of, of a demand for hedging strategies. Um, you know, investors are chasing overseas return. I'm sure you guys have all heard about, uh, you know, the opportunities in Europe as QE develops. You also have a very strong dollar right now, so you can buy a lot with your money, um, not only in the equity markets, but uh, real estate markets. Uh, I was over at an event in, in uh, March uh, over in Europe, and it was astounding how much cheaper everything was just from a year ago. It's 20 to 30% cheaper in terms of asset valuation. So you're going to see a lot of investment dollars going over there, as well as a lot of uh, tourists going back to Europe over the next uh, uh, 6 to 12 months. Uh, again, the complexity of our market it just gets more and more complex every single day. Uh, more exchanges, more strikes, more expirations. Uh, it's just on and on and on. Uh, you know, we, we depend on technology, and it's going to continue to remain a huge, huge part of our market. Um, but we have to make sure that everything works, that there's backups, there's fail-safes, DR recovery uh, uh, activities. Um, we're just so depending on, on what we do uh, electronically these days that it's, it's a bigger and bigger challenge. Um, and firms are looking at this and how can they afford to continue to invest in systems and backup facilities that they may never use. It's a huge, huge drain and cost on the industry. So, you know, firms are going to value whether they want to be in this business anymore, whether from a vendor or broker um, or exchange, uh, you know, environment. Um, consolidation, uh, acquisition, and more exits. Uh, you've had a number of very, very large market makers that have been in the business for a long time exit uh, over the past year. Uh, household names, UBS, JPM, Credit Suisse, Merrill Lynch. I mean, these are all big firms that used to be options market makers that are no longer in the business. Uh, costs, uh, compliance issues, Basel III, regulatory issues are, are, are looking and are pushing competition, are pushing these firms out of the business, and it's not going to stop. Um, you know, there's a lot of concentration of, of activity in the bigger firms, uh, and smaller market making firms are struggling to, to remain in business and compete. Uh, and then last but not least, regulatory environment. Uh, you know, again, ball three is, is really just started to impact our industry. Uh, it'll have a bigger, bigger impact down the road. It'll, it'll force banks to rationalize where they put their funds, where they put their dollars to work. Um, again, exits, consolidation are a given. Compliance costs. I had a, a chart uh, that I saw out of Washington that, you know, looked at all the different uh, regulatory issues that, uh, that are impacting the industry. And I, I was going to put it in the presentation, but it was too small to read. Um, but it's, it's just amazing how much regulatory, uh, regulatory uh, burden is, is hanging over the financial industry these days. And then again, you know, watch out for the election, what happens after the election, um, and, uh, and, and where we go from there. But there will be you know, more attention focused on Wall Street, more ways to look at to raise revenue from, uh, from all the fat cats up there. And, and uh, so stay tuned on, on that side. 
Uh, so with that, I'll, uh, I'd like to again thank you guys for, uh, for coming this morning. I know it's a beautiful day out there, and, and uh, thanks to Box for, for putting on this event. Thank you very much. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 